See, we still got the army guy up here. I'm going to put that in my pocket and take it somewhere so it's not up here all the time. Well, praise the Lord. Continue to pray for Brother Wally in his recovery and, of course, Brother Durego as well. Continue to pray for Brother Wilson. Of course, he's up in the hospital and um, I pray the Lord's will be done there. And uh, pray for the Del Hayes. Brother Del Hay is going to be doing the funeral for his mother-in-law this coming Wednesday. And so you pray for him. There's a number of lost family members that will be there. And so that will be a very important time. And I know that the family appreciates your prayers. And let's see. By the way, appreciate you praying for me while I was going up there in Pennsylvania. In Amish land, man. I mean, we were around Lancaster, Leola. And I tell you, I had some of the best ice cream I've ever had in my life. There is an Amish farm just, uh, well, I couldn't tell you whether it was north, south, or east of the city, but it was out in the country, and they specialize in selling ice cream. I mean, made natural from the cows. I had some of the best blackberry ice cream I think I've ever eaten. Thought about rubbing it in my hair so it'd get on my pillowcase at night, you know. And <laughs> I'd have sweet dreams that way. That would, that would have been nice. But anyway, and a waffle cone to boot on top of that. But it was just, um, it was great. Had, uh, had a young man, 19-year-old young man that got saved on Sunday morning. And uh, had a couple new people coming out. So praise the Lord for that. That's the third time I've been there. Well, we've got some very important stuff coming up here. Of course, this coming Saturday is going to be our, uh, our, our neighborhood picnic. And I want you inviting folks out for that. Now, we've got so many door prizes just to give away. It's going to be really good. As a matter of fact, uh, Chick-fil-A, I think, has given us about $205 sandwich things to give away. I mean, that's a bunch. That's a bu Maybe it's 100 Maybe it's – but that's still a bunch. That's a lot. So, anyway, uh, we have a, a number of area – uh, places that have donated stuff for us to give away for the neighborhood picnic and of course you'll be uh, we'll be making up a banner so you'll be able to see all of them that having a part in that and uh, but that begins at 10 o'clock this coming Saturday and we'll go to about three o'clock and so we'll make more announcements on it on on uh, Wednesday but if you can come the weather's supposed to be great it's supposed to be like it is today so we're, man, it couldn't get much more perfect than that. Madison Fire Department, as long as they're not called out to something, they're supposed to have a truck here, and the, uh, the Sheriff's Department for Madison County is supposed to have a, a car here as well during that time. Uh, we're just looking forward to just a great time in the Lord and hopefully an opportunity to meet a bunch of folks from out of town. Uh, big, it's a big deal. Then, of course, coming up right here on the 23rd, 
begins our revival. Brother Jason Kendrick is going to be with us, and it looks like it's going to work out to where his whole family can be with us for years. Um, he and his wife and his kids have sung with them, and now they're grown, so they don't get much opportunity to, to sing together anymore. Uh, but they're going to come in, uh, and the kids are going to be with them, and they're going to be singing during the thing. You'll enjoy that, and you'll enjoy his preaching, just good straight Bible preaching. It'll be a great time together uh, for the whole week. But now the 23rd is also the 39th anniversary of Madison Baptist Church, and we'll have dinner on the grounds that day, so afterwards everyone will be invited to stay and eat. And again, an opportunity for you to get to meet some people and just let's put our best foot forward and uh, hopefully reach some people with the gospel of Christ. Be inviting folks out for that too. You know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if we don't have people to hear it, guess what's not going to happen? It's going to be up to us. I, I know I got a preacher that's going to preach the book and he's going to be faithful doing his part. Now we need to do our part get some people here for it, and we got to be here for it, you know, make sure you're here for it in every service as well. Well, okay, we're continuing to learn about missions and the local church, and so that's why this series was started, and I appreciate all the work that Brother Nelson has put into it, and always a great Sunday school teacher. So, Brother Nelson, come give it to us again. All right. It's hard to follow up ice cream and Chick-fil-A and dinner on the grounds. <laughs> I don't know what to say other than my stomach may say. <laughs> All right, you heard him. <laughs> well, let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We've talked about a lot of things concerning missions. Most recently, we talked about the people of missions. We talked about some of the missionaries that worked with the Apostle Paul, uh, the very well-known missionary of the New Testament. A very good example, the right example, the correct example. And we've talked about the, the pitfalls of missions, uh, the uh, <clears throat> problems with missions. And uh, this morning we're going to be talking about the partners in missions. Missions cannot go on its own. Missions is a church, an assembly, activity, ministry. All right, let me, I'm going to clarify some of those words. Uh, it's not just an activity, but it is the central ministry of the New Testament and of the New Testament church. That is reproducing ourselves in other places, not just soul winning, but bringing people to Christ and building them up in Christ and then sending them out, out from the local church to reach the world for Christ as well. It's a multiplication. It works. It's God's way. And so we're going to be talking about the partners in missions this morning. God has a purpose. His purpose for us is to assemble together. His purpose for us is to live together, to minister together, to be encouraged. As we've said before, he, he has no orphans. He wants everyone to be part of a local congregation, a local family where you're loved, where you're edified, where you're corrected, uh, where there's some uh, constructive uh, building and there's also that correction that we so often need and so many times it comes from the preaching of God's word. We're going to look at several things this morning, time permitting. Uh, we'll just go as far as we can. Uh, <clears throat> fasten your safety belts in case I pick up speed. Uh, but I want you to see in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 9. I'm sorry, verse 5. We'll read through verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. He says, who it then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. We're talking about some helpers here. We're talking about partners in missions. He says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God giveth the increase. This is God that does that, but he's using it as we minister together as partners in fulfilling God's great commission. He goes on in verse 8. He says, now that he that planteth uh, and he that watereth are one. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. And here's the key verse. For we are laborers 
together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Again, this morning, how we labor together, we are partners together in missions. We're going to be talking about partners in the church. We're going to be talking about partners at home and partners on the field if we get that far. If not, then we can take up next week with part of that. So let's just bow in a word of prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you for your holy word. But we thank you, Lord, not only for your example, but for your instruction in how the church is to perform what the church is to do and how we're to do it. We'd ask you, Lord, this morning, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit for your name's sake, for your word's sake, and for your church's sake, Lord, that you'll receive glory, that there might be understanding from your word, Lord, that we, as partners together in reaching the world for Christ, might understand that missions is the core. It's not just a ministry. It's a core, the core of the local church, whether we're supporting missionaries, whether we're sending missionaries, or whether we are missionaries. We commit our morning to you this, the Lord's day, and we thank you. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, interestingly, um, at least I think it's interesting, listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians 8.3. I'll get my tongue untangled or my tangled untongued. Um, 2 Corinthians 8.23, he says, Whether any do inquire of Titus, remember we spoke about Titus? He was a faithful one. He was one that was trusted. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you. God provides helpers. Missions cannot stand alone. A missionary doesn't go out on his own. It doesn't work like that. A missionary is an extension of his home church, his sending church, and other churches that support him. And there's a lot of support that takes place. Now, <clears throat> since the first of the year, uh, we've had, we have about 600 supporters of our 26 missionary families. Maybe more than that, most likely more than that. Some of those are individuals, but most of those are local congregations, local churches who have the same uh, faith, the same uh, view on Scripture, and the same practice that we do, all right? Churches like ours are very similar to ours. By the way, I'll qualify that by saying there is no church that's exactly the same. Every church, every pastor, every congregation is different, but not hugely different. It's amazing how that in Scripture, when you follow the Scripture, how, how closely aligned that churches are together uh, as they minister in their local, local assemblies. It's just amazing. So we'll, we'll move on. He says in Amos 3.3, can two walk together except they be agreed? Well, the answer is no, they cannot. So we must have some agreement with these other congregations and we must have some agreement among us in this congregation as far as our unity goes and our purpose and the direction that God leads us. This morning we're going to begin with not only partners in the church but giving partners in the church, those who give. Again, some 600 plus churches who support our missionaries alone we support our missionaries for at least a, a fourth of their support. Actually, it's just a little bit more than that. Uh, and we praise the Lord for that. You are, you are a giving church. You're not the only ones. There's many others, small congregations. Uh, some of you know that we've had a problem with our mail back in August, and some of our missions checks were taken. Um, so far, uh, 20 of our missionaries have been affected by that. Um, we haven't heard the end of it yet. As there's, churches are still contacting us. We sent letters out to all the uh, supporters of our missionaries. And uh, some are following up with that. That is checking their records. Now, in, in regards to that, we've had a lot of churches call us. And a number of churches, they, when they call me, uh, and boy, it's been, been a busy phone. Uh, but when they call, um, some would say, well, you know, we're, we're just a small church. We, support, we only support one of your missionaries. We're just a small church, you know. We have like 40 people, 35 people. Let me say, those are the most faithful. Those small churches, uh, we began our ministry 30 years ago. 30 years ago, some of those same small churches still support us. 
after 30 years. Faithful, faithful people and sacrificial giving. We're going to be talking in Scripture. We're going to be pointing in Scripture something that, that oh, you know, we really don't care to hear this because it's not really faith promise missions time. And some of you know exactly where I'm going with that. But this matter of giving, I'm going to give you 10 10 uh, uh, things from Scripture, 10 things, uh, 10 lessons from Scripture uh, about this matter of giving, giving in the local church, giving for missions. Now, you understand our missions program doesn't come out of our general uh, fund. Uh, 10% does. It goes to missions. Uh, and that 10% uh, then is, is added to, to what, it, what our other churches who support our missionaries, it's added to that. But our, our, our missions giving is by faith promise. That is, we promise to give as the Lord lays on our heart what to give, and we make a promise. By the way, that's a vow. Uh, a vow that God intends us to keep. And we'll see some scriptures concerning that in a moment. But this faith promise is the right way. It's the Bible way. I'm absolutely convinced of that. In the early days, when I was first exposed to faith promise, I thought, you know, this just, I'm just not sure if that's scriptural. Well, we're going to see some scriptures this morning that might clear that up for you as it did for me and as, it, as it's done for me. By the way, our missionaries also give faith promise. Our missionaries also tithe. And they don't tithe to themselves. <laughs> you understand that? Uh, and they type to the local church here. Um, our missionaries are recipients, but they are givers. I think our missionaries are some of the biggest givers because they give so much, so much, and not only to the local congregations here, but to their congregations wherever they're serving around the world. And we currently have ministries in about, well, we have ministries in about 15 countries, but we have missionaries uh, on active uh, status in about 10 countries. And uh, uh, everywhere the sun shines, Madison Baptist Church is represented. If not by the missionaries that are sent out of our church, but by the other missionaries, the some 80 some plus missionaries that our church supports that aren't from this congregation. Well, wow, that's quite a good, that's, that, I like that. Well, let's take a look at, at Scripture. We're, we're going to be turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Some of you know exactly where we're going with this message. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We'll try to move quickly. Ten lessons we can learn from, from giving, and it's concerning our promise to God and supporting missions. Now, you understand that the giving that took place here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we'll look at some chap, uh, chapter 9 as well, you, you have to understand their giving was for the poor saints in Jerusalem. It was also some of that giving was to support the missionaries uh, who would come through uh, who weren't tent makers or who chose uh, for that local church to, to help support them. All right. So it's not exactly the same thing. We don't have the Jerusalem church sending out money to support the Apostle Paul. We don't see that in Scripture. But the need is the same. Missionaries to go to a foreign field, missionaries to go to, uh, to Perry County, Tennessee, as we have one there, a church planner there, they need support and uh, they have to be supported by finances. Amazingly, missionaries are kind of on the lower end of the economical food chain. <laughs> All right, I'm trying to be gentle about that. But they are, we are, we're kind of a, but you go into some places, Maybe Middle Tennessee, maybe uh, Brazil, uh, maybe South Africa. You go to some places and all of a sudden you're not on the lower rung, you're on the higher one. Because you have a car and sometimes you have enough money to put gas in that car. And so immediately, oh, <laughs> there's one of those rich Americans. Maybe I can attach myself to him for a while. Uh, it's not unheard of for a national sometime to, to, to come to a missionary and say, would you be my missionary? <laughs> you have to think about that. What's he mean by that? Will you be my missionary? Churches say, will you be our missionary? Yeah. But for a national, someone overseas, the, someone out and about, and they say, would you be my missionary? Well, that simply means they're looking for the fatted calf, and there's one right there. <laughs> we want some of, the, some of the excess that's running off. 
in your ganda. Oh, I can't get away from this one. I, I just have to share. Uh, I was surprised to hear someone say, not someone, many people say, and there were children at first, and then adults started saying the same thing. Just I wasn't exposed to the adults that would say that until later. Uh, but they would say, Mazungu, which means white man or wealthy person, it means European actually. But Mazungu, Mazungu, give me my money. I thought, well, they just don't know English very well. And uh, I'd say, well, I don't have your money, sorry. Uh, and I don't have any extra to give you today, sorry. Uh, they didn't, they spoke correctly. They weren't saying, if you have some money, I'd like a little, if you have a little extra. What they were saying was, you're rich, you're here, someone sent you, you have money, and they sent, and I just simply want my, the part that belongs to me. <laughs> Different mindset, I know. Mazungu, give me my money. Well, now, I thought, that's the children, boy, they need to be, <laughs> that's just odd. Well, then, then you have churches and you have church members that say the same thing. I had a, a, a bishop with the, with the Anglican church there in Kabali, and he came to my house one day. He says, I want to be a Baptist. And I said, what? <laughs> what do you think a Baptist is? And he says, well, you, you guys are rich. You got, you got a car. and uh, you, got a, you, you, you live in a, in a house. You have furniture. You, uh, you even got a dog. And, you, and man, you've got it all. <laughs> I want to be a Baptist. And I said, no, you don't want to be a Baptist. Uh, I tried to share the gospel with him, and he wouldn't have any of that. Um, what he needs was Christ. That was his need. He didn't need the things of the world. There's a, there's a real economic divide sometimes. That's simply what I'm saying. There's an economic divide. In the States, while a missionary is on furlough, or while they're, especially while they're raising support, a young missionary who hasn't been to the field yet, uh, who doesn't have a support much, he can't put tires on his car because he's quit his job and he's living church by church, <laughs> love offering to love offering, um, hey, there ought, to be, there ought to be some help for that. Uh, and, and are they lower on the income list? You know they are. They're, they need help. They need encouragement. And, but then a missionary who comes back on furlough, he has basically his support, but he needs to raise more for the ministry. He needs more for the ex, ex, his growing family, that kind of a thing. And so he needs new meetings. And uh, he can afford, perhaps, he's got money set aside now for tires. He's got some money set aside for, for vehicle and expenses. We want to get to this matter of not just the perception of what missionaries are. Are they rich? Are they poor? Are they in between? Can you support missionaries too much? I'm of the persuasion that if the, if the missionary is true to God, true to the ministry, his heart is to serve, you cannot give him too much. Because he's, he's the one who's giving it out. He's the one who's using it on the field. Uh, he's the one who's supporting others. Our mission churches, by the way, just to clarify, haven't even got the lesson yet, but our mission churches support missionaries too. Did you know that? You understand that? They do faith promise missions in the church plants, uh, in Africa, in, in uh, Korea, anywhere you go. There's one of the first things that takes place is that they take on missionaries of their own. Some are American missionaries. Some are national missionaries. Some are missionaries of other uh, nationalities serving in other places in the world. So it's, it's not we're supporting, we're the only ones doing this kind of a thing. No, that's the New Testament way. And God blesses a church that gives. And God blesses a church that reaches the lost anywhere and everywhere. Again, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. These are preachers, these are those who are sharing the gospel one-on-one -on -one and preaching the gospel as they go. I can remember days where I'd have to go to the police department for six months every single day trying to get a driver's license. And... Uh, Praise God, it was the opportunity to preach. I'd just get my Bible out. They said, nope, the guy's not here today. And I said, well, I am. So here we go. And uh, I'd share the gospel. They heard it over and over and over again until finally they thought, I guess we'll have the guy come in and give him a license. <laughs> and so anyway, that took, that took place. But the word of God was, was, was preached. Let me, uh, let me 
start with, with 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. 2 Corinthians 8, 1. Notice what it says. I will try to move quickly. It's going to be difficult. I, I keep getting sidelined here. Moreover, brethren, we do you whit the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. The churches in Macedonia were those up in Philippi. He's, he's writing the Corinthians who are in Achaia, uh, down just in, 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 uh, uh, in Greece. And uh, he's saying, hey, there's a grace, and that grace is being extended to you. The churches in Macedonia were poor. The church in Achaia, as far as we can tell, was fa fairly wealthy. Uh, the church in, in Corinth was a wealthy church. Uh, there was a, a place of a lot of commerce taking place. It, it was wealthy. It was just in the outskirts of Athens, just across the way from Athens. And there, there was people, they had jobs there. There was work there. Up in Macedonia, not so much in some of those churches there. Uh, the, the, the church at Philippi, the church at Berea, the church at uh, Thessalonica. Uh, those were churches that, that weren't, didn't have so much going on as in, in Corinth. So he's writing this church in Corinth. He says, he says, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. God gave a special grace to that church at Philippi, a special grace. It was the grace of giving and giving is a grace. Now, not just the unmerited favor, but the enabling power of God. God working in them and through them to give. We're going to see how they gave. So number one, I'm going to give you 10 of these. You might want to jot some of these down. I, I, I think they're, they're worth remembering. Number one, giving. Giving above your tithe. Your tithe is not giving. Your tithe belongs to God. The first tenth of everything we have. It belongs to God. The first of all of our increase belongs to Him. So that's, that's beside the point. But this is giving beyond that. Giving of our hearts, our love giving of our substance. He says, giving is a grace. That's number one. Giving is a grace. And that grace was seen in the church at in the churches in Macedonia because they were, they, were, they were givers. Now, I think sometimes we have cirrhosis of the giver. Pardon me. <laughs> but we have so much and that's why we give so little. I believe Corinth had the same situation. Matter of fact, we're going to see scripture where it's, it's evident. They made a promise to give. And a year later, hello, they still hadn't given. And the churches that Macedonia had, they were encouraged by, by the church, by, by the promise that the church in, uh, in Corinth had made that they were going to give. And they thought, wow, these wealthy, there's no telling what kind of an offering is going to be given. We're going to give too. And so the poor people gave and the rich people didn't. So Paul had to write them and say, we're waiting, we're looking. <laughs> I'm sending Titus for it, get it ready. Whoa. Well, let's move right on. In verse 2, it says, How then in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. This is the, here's number two. The grace of giving has a source. It has a source, and it's not affluence. That matter of fact, affluence or having too much uh, works against giving because so not all the time, don't get me wrong. We have some people who, who have some affluence, not influence, affluence, all right, who have some affluence here uh, in, in our congregation and in other churches. Uh, God has blessed them, and they, and they share that. They give that. But so many times it works counter to that. It's opposite of that. They want to hold on to what they have and, and they have to spend their time and their efforts protecting what they have so they still have what they have. So number one, giving's a grace. Number two, the grace of giving has a source. Here it is. How in verse two, how in a great trial of affliction, these people had great afflictions. They had great problems. They had, they had all kinds of, remember, this is, this is where the, the Jews were against the, the Christians, the believers there. They had great persecutions. And it says, number one, their great trial of afflictions. And number two, the abundance of their joy. They were joyful in the afflictions. They were rejoicing in God. There is, there's a key. The givers are, are those who are rejoicing in God regardless of the situation. And then it says, and their deep poverty. 
abounded under the riches of their liberality. When we were in, in Kabali, Uganda, we had a need of $11,000 to complete a building. This was back in, the, uh, um, back in the day, the last century sometime, back in the 90s. And uh, uh, $11,000 was just way too much. We had a church up in New England who the city said, we're going to close you down. You need, you need to, to pave your parking lot or we're going to close you down. And my brother was a member of that church. And uh, uh, in their deep poverty, they needed $50,000. They didn't have it. They were trying to raise a small congregation, a fairly new church plant. And they did not have the money, but they sent us $2,000. In their deep poverty, in their affliction, but with their rejoicing and joy, they sent us $2,000. And God provided for them for that parking lot. He did. He did. That church still supports us. Wow. Amazing. And we were able to, to finish the building project. Now, those with great needs who have a great heart for God will have a great heart for others. Giving is a grace. The grace of giving has a source. It's not affluence. It's not overabundance. It's the heart. The heart of rejoicing. The heart of wanting to give. Uh, the riches of their liberality in, 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 in giving. Not talking about politics. Liberality here means they're letting it loose. They let it fly. Hey, God gave it. I'm ready to give it. Which way does it go, Lord? You just let me know. Wow. Number three, grace. The grace of giving has no limits. It has no limits. Verse three, he says, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, no limits. Beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying with uh, with us. Now notice what their prayer was. <laughs> and they were pleading with the apostles. They were pleading uh, with the apostle Paul. They were pleading with the missionaries, praying with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. Please take this gift, please. <laughs> wow. I, I'll be honest with you, when, uh, when people offered gifts and they offer gifts. Uh, uh, they don't normally have to plead too long. <laughs> well, if you insist. <laughs> but they were pleading. The apostle Paul knew that they were, they were poor. He knew that they were in great trials of affliction. But he also knew their heart and he knew the God who had their heart. And so they pleaded with him. The grace of, of giving has no limits. Beyond their power, they were willing of themselves praying with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us, here it is, the fellowship of ministering to the saints. There's fellowship in that grace, fellowship. They loved those saints. They wanted to, they had not met those saints. They loved them. They heard about them. They knew about them. They were praying for many of these were Gentiles up in Macedonia. These were Jews that they were helping. Number four, the grace of giving has a beginning. It has a beginning. Well, we see that in verse 5. He says, And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave of their own selves to the Lord. There's the key. Are you with me? There's the key. They gave their own selves to the Lord. That settled it. That settled it. And to us, by the will of God, God worked on their hearts. That's what it's saying. It was God's will. He opened their hearts to, to those who had needs. And it wasn't necessarily the Apostle Paul and those missionaries that worked with him. Again, this is for the collection of the, of the poor saints who were going through uh, great, great difficulty up in Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem was a Jewish, uh, a, a Jewish place. Uh, and the Christian Jews were, they were last on the list of getting any provision. They had to stick together. Thousands of them had trusted Christ. But many of them had scattered because of persecution. He says, he says, he first gave their own selves unto, uh, unto, uh, to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Verse 6, in so much that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you. Watch, he would finish in you, Corinthians, rich people, that he would finish in you the same grace also. So those in Macedonia, they were poor, they were afflicted, they were rejoicing. They had the grace of giving. They had the source of that grace of giving. They had the uh, no limit of the grace of giving. They had uh, the beginning of that grace, which was surrendering their hearts totally to God and his will for their 
resources for whatever God would give to them. And then verse 5, the grace of giving has some requirements. There are some requirements for that grace. We see that in verse 10. In verse 10. He says in verse 10, he says, And herein I give my advice, for, for this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but to also to be forward a year ago. Now, what, what he's saying is, you, you, you said something a year ago, and we're looking for it still. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, you're willing, there also may be a performance also out of that which you have. Okay, do it then. Do it. You said you were going to give? We've waited. Do it. So the grace of, of giving has a requirement not just to have a, a willing heart, but a doing heart. Do it. <laughs> Do it. God's laid something on your heart. You know a particular need of a particular person. I'm not talking about missions necessarily here, but a particular need for a particular person and God's laid it on your heart. Let me think here. If you have a willing heart, then there's one more step that you have to fulfill. You have to do it. You have to complete what God has spoken to you about. Do it. And then, number six, the grace of giving challenges others. It does. It challenges others. Look what it says in chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. For us touching the ministering to the saints, talking about giving, that's how they were ministering to the saints. Remember, there's only two types of people in the world, the saints and the ain'ts, the haves and the have-nots, those who have Christ, those who have not. The saints here are simply believers, and every believer is separated unto God. That's a saint, separated unto him. So for us touching the ministry, ministering to the saints, it is superfluous, superfluous of me for to write to you. That means it's no use to do that. For I, I know the forwardness of your mind. I know what you're thinking, for which I boast of you to them in Macedonia and Achaia, uh, that, that, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. What are you saying here? Your, your statement that you're going to give, man, that, that provokes so many. Hey, the grace of giving challenges others. That's numbers. It challenges others. When you give, it challenges others to give. Faith promise, we just take our promises and give them to the Lord and we give them to the church to, 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 to figure out some kind of a budget. But our giving for missions always exceeds that and we praise God for that. But each year it ought to increase. It does in my family. Each year it increases and we think, well, how can I give more than that? Man, and every time God does it, it's God giving through you. If you have a willing mind, a willing heart, giving yourself to God, yeah, he is able to do just that. It challenges others. He says in verse 3, Yet have I sent brethren, lest your boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, you may be ready, lest happily they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared. Oh no, you're going to be embarrassed. That we say not that you should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up the beforehand your bounty, your giving. <laughs> We're going to take it up, get it ready. We're coming. Whereof you had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. In other words, we're, we're not being covetous here. You said you're going to give. That's all. We're, God laid it on your heart. We're coming for it. But this I say that he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Now, here's number seven. The grace of giving multiplies our gift. The grace of giving multiplies the gift. Hey, you give a little, God, God, God uses little and makes much of it. He multiplies it. He always does that. When we give it to him, he always, hey, 90%, 10 belongs to God, but 
he gives to me the choice to do with it whatever I want? Oh, it better be right scripturally. It better not be full of covetousness. And we better be careful when we make a promise to God. <laughs> hey, let me give you a, let me give you a, let me give you a warning. Here's what Deuteronomy 23.21 says. Deuteronomy 23.21. Make a note of this. This is, this is, uh, this is serious. In Deuteronomy 23.21 it says, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, and thou shalt not slack to pay it. Talking about paying. <laughs> right. I made a vow. Okay, I'm going to give this. This is the Corinthians. They made a vow to God. They made it publicly. They made a vow. We're, we're going to give. And the churches of Macedonia were poor. They said, man, they're going to give. We're going to give. They gave, but Corinth didn't. Hello. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it, for the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and, would be, it would, and it would be sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. That is, if you didn't make a vow, then you just freely give or not give as you want. But when you, how about Ananias and Sapphira? Mm. They made a vow. We gave it all. And they lied to the Holy Spirit and they woke up dead. He says in verse 23, Deuteronomy 23, 23, that which is gone out of thy lips shall thou keep and perform. Even, here it is, even a free will offering. In other words, I decided to give it myself. Well, good, then you better give it. Even a free will offering, according to as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. Faith, promise, warnings. <laughs> wow. So the grace of giving multiplies our gift. Uh, how much we give multiplies the, re, the results. That's what, it's, that's what it's saying in, in, in 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Again, but this I say that he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. Yeah? You sow a little, you give a little. Guess what? You get back a little. But if you give much, you get back much. He that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. What are we sowing here? what is being sown? Hey, we sow the, word, the seed of the word of God. It works the same way. He's talking about finances here. Hello. This is finances. It's not soul winning here. It works the same. He's talking about finances. He says in verse 7, every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. Here's another one. How we give, not only how much we give, but how we give our attitudes, how we give multiplies the results. Not just our actions in giving, little or much, but how we give it determines if it's going to be multiplied. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly, not of necessity. God loves a cheerful Hilarious giver. <laughs> and sometimes we give and... <laughs> uh, okay. No, no. He loves it. Don't give. Don't give. Unless you made a vow, you better give. You made a promise to God, you better give. I'm just saying. That's what he says. Well, number nine, the grace of giving does multiply. But number nine, when we give it, it extends God's grace to all other areas of our life. Whoa. When he has our pocket or our pocket book, he has our heart. Let me turn that around. When he has our heart, then he has our pocket or our pocket book. He does. Can you take a, a temperature, your, a, self, a self temperature check? Does he have control of the pocket? That tells about the heart. Matter of fact, we'll read the verse. It's in verse 8 here. Chapter 9, verse 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, <laughs> that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. In other words, as we give, God gives back. The prescriptions are full of that. Experience is proof of that. 
But that grace of giving ex extends to all areas of our life. Grace, grace, God's grace, marvelous grace, infinite grace. Here's the last one, number 10. Our giving sows seed that multiplies the blessings. Our giving sows seed that multiplies the blessings. That's what he's talking about. Seed we sow has results. He says in verse 9, as it is written, he that dispersed abroad hath given to the poor. Well, there you go. The poor get something. Doesn't stop there. Here's another blessing. Not only the poor receive. He says, his righteousness remaineth forever. He's looking to God and thanking God for the wonderful gifts that he's received from others. And God knows, and boy, a, a gift given in secret is the best kind. God provided it. He goes on, verse 10, Now he that ministers seed to the sower ministers bread for your food. Now that is, talking about finances here. So there's, there's Titus, he's a sower. He's, he's coming, he's going to deliver. He's going, he, the Apostle Paul going to go up to Jerusalem, going to deliver the, the finances that were taken up, that were promised to God. That seed to the sower, the apostle Paul is a sower. He, okay, so it ministers bread. <laughs> it, it, the seed ministers bread for your food. So when the person gives, God's saying, okay, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to feed you. There, I, I'm keep, he keeps good records. He doesn't lose a dime. He keeps good records. Ministers bread for your food and multiplies your seed sown. So not only is he going to provide for your food now, he's providing seed, more seed for the future. Wow. We're talking about finances. Again, it works in all areas of our life, not just in finances. And he's not finished. And increase the fruits of your righteousness. There's even more righteousness known. Verse 11, being enriched by everything in all, uh, to all bountifulness, which causes through the thanks, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. God is praised. God is glorified. Doesn't stop there. It just keeps going. Verse 12, he says, For the administration of this service not only supplies the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgiving to God. Okay. Wow. I'm convinced. <laughs> Are you? Is God's word true? Let's do things his way. Here's the other side of that. Here's how the seed of the word of God works. Isaiah 55, 10 says, For as the rain cometh down and snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower. Not talking about money here. I believe he's talking about precious souls, uh, souls and the seed of the word of God that Jesus talked about. The sower of the seed is the, uh, the, seed is the word of God sowing in, 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 in hard ground, in stony ground, in thorny ground, and in good soil. That it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be, he tells us. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Boy, howdy. You see, it works the same way. And that, the fact is, does, does God have our heart? Then God, then do it. Do it. Not just giving. Do what God says. Do it. Hey, this place of, of, of prayer here at the, at the altar when God speaks, do it. Respond, do it. God brings something to your heart, do it. That's grace. The grace of giving is also the grace of living. It is His grace. Oh, that we might have more of His grace. Well, I didn't get to the partners in the church and the partners at home and the partners on the field. We'll talk about some of that next week, but let me close with the passage. Two, two verses. I'll just read them to you. Two verses. We started with this one. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, for we are laborers together with God. Praise the Lord. We are laborers together 
with God. He's the one. Jesus Christ is the reason we're here. We are laborers together with God. You're God's husbandry. You're God's building. He says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, Wherefore we labor. There's a good reason. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. And here's why. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to give an answer. We are accountable for that which God puts in our heart and what God puts in our pockets and what God puts in our lives. There's an accounting day coming. The judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. How is the grace of giving and the grace of living? Do we have the cirrhosis of the giver today? No. We belong to him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Lord, you're so good to us. You've given us so much and we're so accountable to you. You've given us the precious holy word of God, the seed to eternal life. As faith in this word, Lord, faith in our Savior, faith in the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection saves us and will save every lost person who will call upon him. Oh, the need is great. The need is us in our hearts. Lord, we give ourselves to you. Take us, mold us, use us for your name's sake, for your purpose, for your church. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you.